I have with me Dr. Uh, uh, Kodanram Reddy, more popularly known as Professor Kodanram, and welcome to my show, sir. <coughs> Thank you for uh, you know giving your time yeah. and. So, sir, like uh, mostly everyone knows about what's happening now. What you're, you know, you're actively, uh, you know, in the news these days, and you've usually been in the news for a long time. But I, I want to talk about your beginning. I want to talk about the person behind the doctor, the professor. When you were a little child, where did you grow up? I want to know the whole journey, sir. If you could please. Yeah, there isn't uh, anything very significant to talk about, but. Uh, Nonetheless, you know. Where did you grow up? I I was uh, actually I was uh, born and brought up in uh, born in Manchurial, Manchurial, uh, a very small town in those days. Perhaps you know it spread about one and a half kilometers. Um, so that's where I have grown. My father wasn't from a very uh, economically very sound family. He they had very small patch of land on which uh, the entire family they, those days there used to be very big joint families so there were six seven of them so the f land was insufficient to feed all of them so my uncles have moved away from the village one of them went to Bhupalpalli the other went a village near Manchurial so in search of uh, some better opportunities, my father who studied up to fourth or fifth class and knew how to read and write Urdu, he was good at calculations. So he uh, went in search of livelihood, he went to Bhupalpalli, re realized that uh, there, isn't many, there aren't many chances. So he went to Manchurial. He has not uh, secured any support from his family members. So then uh, he came back and then after a while he went again because he knows uh, write and read and write and make ca calculations. Some forest contractors required his support. So he was, he had these skills, they required a person like that. So he worked with them. He was a manager kind of, clerk uh, manager kind of person who was helping them. When they cut down trees, he What year are we talking about? <coughs> Oh, <laughs> in the 50s, <laughs> this, was, that was, this was in uh, 47, 46, 47. Mm. And this plot of land you talk about, was it that farming? Was yeah, my father's uh, family was, a, they were agricultural family. So they were uh, having six, seven acres, so insufficient to meet uh, the family needs. So the, he tried, uh, you know, he got a, uh, job there with a forest contractor, a relative, but he worked with him. So calculate, you know, the cu uh, cubic feet of, you know, the, um, the timber that they would uh, fetch. So he would then export it, make the bills. So that's what he was doing. And he would go to the forest when the logs are cut down. They have to be cut properly at a required length and all that. <coughs> he would do that. And uh, that's what he was. And I think, you know, mm, then uh, he brought a small land in order to construct a house. Subsequently, he, he was made a working partner because he was so good, they made him working partner. He saved little money and he became a contractor on his own. So that's how he started his life. He started his life and uh, we were all born there born there, all of us, seven of us in the family, five sisters and two, me and my brother. So we have grown there. In our childhood, we spent there. After uh, we completed five, six years, initially a teacher used to come to our house and teach us. So later my father realized that we should be well educated because he himself was so passionate about it. But however, after fifth, he couldn't continue because of uh, the economic res resources were not available. The family could not afford to send him to a town for education. So he discontinued. So he was however, what he could not do, he wanted us to accomplish. So he sent us to Varangal. 
they preferred Varangal because it was on the railway line. Mm. So a passenger used to go from Mancherial to Kajipet and therefore uh, you know they used to go and lot of relatives so were also It was about there. easy connectivity. It was, there was connectivity was easy and there were good schools in Hanamkonda. Manch Varangal, otherwise known as Varangal to the outside world. So mm, we went there, studied in uh, finished schooling and then graduation in Varangal. So that's how um, you know um, uh, we have a strong connection with Varangal. That's in the of course in vacation we always used to spend in Manchuria. Later my father purchased uh, land close to Manchuria, about 40 kilometers away, uh, because uh, he was from an agricultural family always was a uh, lot of love for agriculture. So he purchased land, he wanted to do agriculture. Um, we used to go there during the vacations, mm. spend time in Manchurial in my father's farm. So that's how life went on mm. till we completed our degree. After degree things begin to happen. In the, when I took admission in the degree courses, uh, the political atmosphere was completely surcharged. There was a huge turmoil within the Congress party. On the one hand, uh, Indira Gandhi was made the Prime Minister by the syndicate, the group of senior Now, what leaders. year are we talking about roughly? I am talking about, you know, by the time I completed my schooling and intermediate, it was 71. So, around uh, 62, I think, I went to Warangal. And 62 to 71, uh, I completed my schooling and all that. And then uh, went to <coughs> um, degree. I took admission in degree college, Arts and Science College, well known in those days. It was a constituent college of Usmania. Because there were not many colleges in Telangana um, during the Nizam's tenure. The university itself has established set up colleges in different places in Aurangabad, in Sikindrabad and women for uh, women to promote women's education they started Koti Women's College. Of course Nizam College was established before, later uh, got affiliated to Usmania University and then Varangal College was also set up by Usmania University. I studied there, took admission in 72 and completed in 75. So, um, um, on the other hand, uh, P. V. Narasimha Rao introduced land reforms. Um, people talk about economic reforms, but P. V. Narasimha Rao over here was much more popular because of the land reforms. It was a very stringent land reform act. Nowhere in the country uh, uh, we see a law as stringent as this. So, I was, uh, you know, uh, discussions were taking place, uh, the land we may have to sub sub file a ceiling and sur surplus lands will be taken away, all that discussion was going on, some in favor of Indira Gandhi because of all these radical measures, because she was promoting socialism, she was working for the elimination of poverty. Uh, essentially people from middle class, lower middle class, they were all fond of Indira Gandhi. But the well-to-do families, they were all very critical of Indira Gandhi. So the discussions used to take place in the families and also on uh, in the tea uh, shops and also in the classrooms. We used to have very intense discussions, uh, some favoring equality, the others favoring uh, um, democracy as if there is a conflict between the two. So those were the wonderful days, you know, we used to read, go out to the library, read books and uh, come back to the classrooms, discuss these issues and the discussion, the debates used to be very intense. And then we had teachers like Professor Hargopal teaching us Professor Shivaram Krishna and there were many others like that. So classroom they used to provoke this discussion and often they used to allow us to talk out. <laughs> so that was the classroom situation. 
um, I have realized very slowly because of uh, you know the ideas that my friends had propounded that uh, democracy, equality, they are not contradictory things. There is a complementary relationship between the two. Unless and until poverty is eliminated, you can't have democracy, a strong democracy. So that's what uh, we realized. And those discussions helped us. Teachers also guided us, you know, to understand these things in great detail by providing us with reading material. And also, they gave us, used to give us a reading list. Mm. So that reading list, uh, list helped us to um, widen our uh, understanding. Mm. Mm. We used to, in the regional libraries, we used to sit and mm. read sometimes. And the library staff, uh, having realized that we are going very regularly, they gave <laughs> us uh, ad membership and allowed us to borrow books. All these regular students. Yeah, we, we were allowed to borrow books. Uh, so uh, that that really shaped us, the libraries, the classroom discussions. And obviously, the teachers sort of give, teachers you, give you the direct direction by letting you, making yes. you think about these yes, things. Yes, yes. Friends of yours, were there any names that we might have heard of or? Uh, no, not many of them. Some of them became <coughs> teachers, but the Others have become clerks and uh, government officers. So uh, none of them have become active in social life. But you continue your moments wherever you are. Like yeah, yeah I, those relations process. are still, I maintain those relations. And I cherish those uh, discussions, where re relations also. So they, uh, th th that's, you know, exactly uh, 75, you remember emergency was imposed. Right. So we were taken aback. We were made to believe that India is one of the biggest democracies in the world. And uh, uh, the military dictatorships um, are in power uh, only in countries like Africa, Middle East, Latin America. A place like India, there is no scope for any authoritarian regime. So that was the understanding. Mm. But uh, it, it, it was a shock of in our life, the biggest shock in our life. Never realized, you know, that these things can happen in India. So when it happened, suddenly, you know, we were uh, kind of, you know, struck by this kind of a decision taken by Indira Gandhiji. So later uh, we decided, you know, trying to understand the rest of the two years during that emergency period, 75 to 77, we were trying to understand why uh, such authoritarian regimes come up in the first instant. Why do they come up? Why do they, you know, such regimes, uh, uh, how to combat over, uh, remove, uh, the such regimes and how to strengthen democracy in India? These were the questions that were bothering us. And what kind of a uh, um, you know, effort uh, that uh, the citizens are expected to do. So, we finally realized that unless and until citizens are al alert, the democracy will not survive. So, we have to strengthen democracy, consentize people, educate people. That's what our role is. So, during the 1977 election, we went around in Sikandrabad campaigning for Janta Party. Of course, in Hyderabad, Janta Party last Congress won with huge majority. Uh, we were not uh, completely disheartened by that. But uh, the campaign has helped us to uh, meet or listen to people like uh, Jay Prakash Narayan, Babu Jagjeevan Ram, Murarji Deshai. So we could listen to people like, uh, you know, of that stature. Uh, there were also other Surendra Mohan. So we were listening to them and uh, that helped us uh, mm, to understand, you know, the political situation in the country. After that, uh, having finished uh, MA, I went to Delhi. Uh, I took admission in JNU to do my MPhil. Mm -hmm. Now imagine emergency was lifted right. and uh, the Janta Party was in power. But uh, because of uh, the political crisis, turmoil, Janta Party government could not survive for long. 
So after very soon two years time uh, the government collapsed and uh, the elections came. Once again Indira Gandhi got elected and then we realized again that you know you can't expect a party to protect democracy in India. It is only our efforts, the conscious, the political uh, training that uh, changes the political situation. So mm, we decided you know we have a role to play. So we should become uh, teachers and work for the protection of democracy. That was the decision we have taken and uh, so it was a conscious decision to become a teacher in the university. Because that it, it uh, uh, number one allows you to read, allows you to understand the world. Number two, you have a little spare time so that you can campaign against uh, authoritarian regimes. You can campaign in uh, um, uh, for civil liberties. You can campaign for democracy. So that's what we did. 1977, having completed, um, I took admission in JNU. 80 I finished my MPhil and came back to Hyderabad. So to be more active in social life. I took admission for my PhD thesis in Central University, 1980. I have not completed my <laughs> thesis there. I got a, a job at Nizam College, so I left that time. Oh. And then I, uh, in I 81 started teaching. So then that year, uh, Kanabiran was the president of AP Civil Liberties Committee. Yeah. So he said, you know, come and take admission. We joined and started working for APCLC. Next 20 years we worked for APCLC, 81 to almost 96 or so. 96 uh, we became constituted in other organization called uh, Human Rights Forum and started working for, continued the same work, but through in a different uh, organization, through a different organization. So that's what uh, life was. I would like, to, of course, <coughs> I, wanna, I want to come down to where you got married here. <laughs> was where did that happen? The marriage during this? Oh, 83, I got married. My post was also regularized and then I got married. It was an arranged marriage. Uh, my father was after me, my mother and father, of course. So they were pestering me that I should marry and settle down. So, does uh, your wife, did your wife also have the same similar thought process? No, we never discussed it. <laughs> we never discussed these issues. I don't know whether she would have agreed to it or not. But then uh, she, uh, we met, uh, we met uh, before the marriage, never talked about it. It's but only after the marriage I, she realized that I also do these things. Was she okay with it then? Uh, a little unhappy, but uh, then <laughs> she got to, you know, she began to adjust to my lifestyle. <laughs> so unhappy because, you know, life used to be very tense. Right. Very tense. It was not so easy. Because you are to working work against regimes. And yeah, you know, against there's always pressure of what can go wrong. Yeah. That was the problem. Did anything like that happen? I mean, they must have been. There were a few occasions, you know when we were implicated in cases or uh, the one or two occasions when we were beaten up and <laughs> things like that happened. But not many in Hyderabad. But friends for uh, my, f my friends who were in the civil liberties movement in the district, they had very miserable experiences. All of them had were forced to either resign and give up the activity or they were uh, to uh, leave the towns come back, come to Hyderabad. Some of them have shifted there uh, to Hyderabad to su survive. There is no other go. They gave up their jobs. Of course, when we hear about it, we only hear about what they did. We don't hear about the countless number of times, the pains they have gone through, the yes. threats they have received, the maybe the slurs, the racial, I don't know, all sorts of problems. And then they are driven to the point of you know, moving or leaving yes. the city. No one leaves your their home just like that. It is not an easy choice yeah, at all. Yeah. So therefore, uh, so y your family also went through the same pressure. Yeah. That pressure was yeah, there. Yeah. Mm. But you didn't stop. I didn't stop. I was, uh, you know, you can't. 
we all of us have taken precautions but uh, right. th that doesn't help you at all it is their decision not yours <laughs> so it is um, uh, but then you can't give up when your own friends uh, die in the course of this conflict you can't give up you have no choice you have to at least uh, uphold uh, their own aspirations and um, their sacrifices should not go wasted so we try to sustain the organization sustain the activity and in being in hyderabad there used to be a great heavy responsibility on all of us because it's over here you can be heard yeah so we have to organize meetings we have to and um, very little support we used to get that was the most uh, difficult time even the very good people well meaning people mm, good friends they won't support you financially or otherwise they won't support you and uh, we had very meager salary so raising money always used to be a dif difficult task yet uh, we used to organize meetings conduct seminars submit representation and more than anything else uh, when you can't go to districts at least in hyderabad uh, you can continue the activity but uh, the for a variety of reasons we started widening our sphere of activity not just you know few cases of police were the violation of rights by the policemen but we started talking about after bhopal gas tragedy we started talking about environmental issues we started talking about uh, lock up deaths uh, we have also raised issues related to um, drought when there is a severe drought we started arguing government uh, citizens should have a right to seek uh, support from the government employment or for that matter ration card and uh, food grains uh, they should be have that right to claim this from the government and government should have a responsibility statutory responsibility to submit it we must campaign for those things in those days kanabran made a suggestion that the manual drought manual is outdated we should ask for renewal of it um you know um, if new drought uh, uh, manual or a new act to deal with this distress situation when there is a economic s distress during the drought the government uh, should bring out an act defining its responsibility and uh, entrusting rights to the citizens to claim support so this was our argument so things like that you know we were raising we were campaigning against uh, environmental pollution those were the activities that we started taking up and then the discourse of uh, civil rights became quite popular uh, more people joined more people joined and uh, the most interesting part of it is in 85 i think you know when the discussion was when our activity was going on we were raising all these issues that time uh, mr vargis was the editor of indian express okay so he offered kanabran uh, uh, some space in indian express sunday indian express mm. to write a detailed article on the uh, you know on the activities of the civil liberties movement mm. and what their contention is so he wrote a very full length article we saw it on sunday morning <laughs> you can't imagine you the kind of pleasure you know the kind of happiness we all had you yeah, we are getting coverage someone bothers to talk about us <laughs> gives space to us uh, thrilled you know it was uh, so such a very thrilling experience so we read it again and again preserved it i i think i i must be still having that article <laughs> so obviously when you are working towards um, trying to change a government which is probably authoritarian then you are dealing with a powerful political party political entities you are dealing with the environment then you are dealing with powerful companies yeah. who have heaps of money and you are dealing with um, uh, issues like lock up desk then you are dealing with the police who by itself is an extremely powerful body which governs uh, 
utilized sometimes. So therefore, so it's a constant threat from so many different quarters. Yeah. Uh, and especially for a group that is working towards it with no really intention of getting any publicity or you're not trying to make money out of it, you're not trying to gain any uh, uh, sort of uh, name with it. And, and that too dependent on meager salaries and small jobs and very average small Indian families. And the family, you have pressure from the families as well, the why you're doing. You have kids? Yes. How many kids do you have? Uh, two. A uh, daughter and a son. A daughter and a son. Uh, so it was, you know, during this period, I had uh, these two of the children were born. And uh, and how, how was it for the kids when they are growing up? Because they go to school, there's constant pressure, something might happen, somebody might do some harm to them. And what, yeah, what father is not around, yeah. he is not taking them anywhere, <laughs> except the book exhibition. Yeah. That's where we all used to go. I used to buy them books. So, so what was it like for them? Um, uh, they always used to say, why, why don't you stay back? Mm, then I said, this is the last time, maybe, which, how, how is this really the last one? They used to ask. So how many times you give the same excuse? <laughs> so there have been so, so many like sacrifices. Th yeah, yeah uh, those discussions used to take place. So the focus was on, so because you know we were doing all these things, we were extremely careful about a few things. We were uh, in the college, you know, as far as our teaching responsibilities are concerned, we were extremely careful. We used to do our job, uh, uh, very uh, take our job very seriously uh, teach uh, the class never used to miss a class mm -hmm. the second thing is that uh, because you know we are bringing forth new arguments of course the constitution talks about it but for as far as the citizens are concerned it's an altogether new discourse unknown to them at that time they have yeah. never used at, at that, that time true. at that time so presenting it in a form that is acceptable is another task this is what we are talking about 80s yeah 80s so this is just 45, we all, 50 years ago all we have is the newspapers and yeah. one national channel yes that's it there is no social media nothing no social and people media. don't know you have to it is all one to one education and okay. making it acceptable in a form that is mm, that looks you know reasonable and uh, acceptable is uh, something that is uh, uh, very difficult. So we used to read extensively the laws, the constitution. We used to read extensively on the philosophy of human rights, mm, on you know the writings of people like uh, um, initially um, um, uh, Lohia, Nehru. So depend on those arguments in order to present, uh, develop some discourse that uh, can be widely circulated. That's another task that we were involved in. So we used to bring out a magazine called Swecha, in which we wrote extensively on some of these aspects. So that's what uh, life was. And this is a time when a common movies. man, if you told him that he has rights, would be surprised. He's like, he oh. would be surprised. Hey, he would be like, can I question the government really? What rights can I have? <laughs> he wouldn't believe. <laughs> he wouldn't believe that I have rights. He wouldn't believe and the best, you know, at best they would say, you know, I, I was not, uh, the, the attack on me was unjust. That's the language they were known, they were used to. Mm. So they would say it is unjust, they can't beat me just like that. But they didn't know that, you know, they can talk in terms of rights. Um, uh, so one of our colleagues, uh, Bajja Tarakam, came out with this book, What If Police Arrest? Mm. So you have a right, mm. you can ask this, you can raise this, you can say this. So that book, came, that book became hugely popular, almost like uh, Tom Paine's uh, Rights of Mankind, sold millions. Similarly, this book also sold million copies. Right. So you are among the first, first rank of, front, uh, of you know, front runners of those, of people who made all this common discourse. Like now when we turn back, you know, it looks to us uh, that, you know, we could do all that. <laughs> Difficult to believe, but we could do all that. Sir, tell me about the Telangana moment. Your uh, we were involved in this and in the 90s, uh, when friends became active in the Telangana moment. 1987-88, uh, uh, a friend of mine called Prabhakar, he lives in Karitabad, even now he lives there. 
Prabhakar used to tell us about Telangana. He used to talk extensively about Telangana. So we were convinced with him. Uh, we forgot our own history. Uh, we forgot our own culture. How can we live like this? We should recall uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, um, popularize our own history. So we were convinced with his arguments. And then we started attending his meetings. That was the initial phase of our engagement with Telangana. Later, um, and uh, we used to listen to any talk on Telangana very carefully. So we did that. Uh, 96, uh, when this discussion widened, then it turned into a movement. But around that time, farmers started committing suicide in Telangana, unknown to Telangana until then. They fought against the mightiest of the rulers, but they never committed suicide. They sacrificed their lives, but they never committed suicide until then. So that really people started asking us questions, how can this, how come this is happening in Telangana? So we started moving around villages to understand these suicides. During those, those days, uh, Professor Keshav of Jadhav uh, uh, used to organize uh, two things, food camps in drought hit villages. Uh, then the second thing was, you know, raise some money and uh, give some uh, cash to these bereaved families. So we used to go there and uh, talk to the members and give them a little support, 2000, 3000 like that. So I was in Kamaredi, I was also a part of this group which was distributing the money. And uh, while the meeting was going on, I stood up and my turn came, I stood up and began to talk. And one farmer uh, then <coughs> charged uh, very aggressively, you know, he got up from his chair, came towards the dais and started asking very aggressively. He was that day, he was very aggressive. He started asking me, do you support only after farmers die or do you have any intentions to stop these, these deaths? Mm -hmm. Of course, we want to stop, but you know, this is what uh, is happening right now and we want to support these families. Then he shouted at, at us. Then I said, "How? What? What do you think we can do to stop this suicide?" So he said, "Bring us water." Then it occurred to us that we have to do something. We have to do something to stop the suicides. So then we started, uh, constituted a committee, went around Telangana, studied these suicides, interviewed people who were, you know, of um, members of those families where come these suicides have taken place. Then we got an understanding that this is due to an economic distress that farmers are committing suicides. That distress can be addressed only if Telangana state is formed. So we started campaigning looking at Telangana issue not purely from a cultural angle but from an economic angle only after that. Then we realized that Telangana is exploited and is suppressed culturally, is exploited economically. Resources, water resources have gone and commercial crops were introduced without uh, assured irrigation. So that is what leads to suicide. So we wanted this issue to be addressed. So we went and uh, then started campaigning for Telangana because we lost our sh due share in the water that we are in this uh, uh, unpleasant situation. So people accepted this argument and then uh, you know the our involvement in Telangana became more intense. So we were more involved in the Telangana movement, um, campaigning, organizing meeting and then this described Telangana as an internal colony, an internal colony that loses resource control over resources an internal colony whose identity is suppressed, an internal colony which is not aware of its own history. Now Telangana has to regain all these things. Separate state is the only way to regain these three things. So let us fight for a separate state. So we started campaigning and then we started Telanganizing every issue to what extent it is connected to the formation of an integrated state. 
So then we started campaigning extensively for Telangana state. This was 97 onwards. 2001, I took membership in an organization called uh, Telangana Aikya Vedika. Later, we formed an organization of our own called Telangana Vijjavantara Vedika and which continues even to this date. And that organization has brought out about 10 booklets and held uh, innumerable meetings, formed committees in every district and in some cases we have units even at the village level. So that is the extent to which we were in involved in this campaign for a separate state. So uh, by 2009 the movement uh, when it became uh, you know widespread then obviously uh, a forum a joint action committee was required to unite all the forces and that is how JSC was created and I became its chairman because we were active mm -hmm. right from 2097 onwards even before that. So I became a chairman of that and uh, that is how I uh, have uh, been an active spokesperson of the movement ever since. But then the forming of uh, TRS coming to power, <coughs> at that point uh, what happened at that time? You were obviously you were a key player in you know TRS coming to power because you were there, you were in the center of it. However you were not part of the politics yes what was that why we have decided that uh, after the formation of the state we should become the um, watchdog we should play a watchdog role we should not join the party we should not take power but we should continue ensure that you know the government uh, um, so uh, you had clarity works with accountability so you wanted to be the watchdog that means you did not want to have the power. Yeah. Now I understand that there is one point that okay there needs to be somebody who needs to be on a neutral ground yes. uh, making sure the government is doing their job. I mean the, the party that is in power. Yeah and that uh, is one part. aspirations for the moment are fulfilled. Right. But is there also another angle to it that uh, if I or we get into power it will corrupt us? Does power corrupt? corrupts you and therefore we should not is there something like that angle as well maybe you know it was a part of our thinking I don't even yes at the subconscious level um, because you know uh, we were so hostile with the political leaders at, the, at every point, point of time you could not see life. yourself in that so uh, visualizing in that position also was something you know we couldn't have imagined we will become part of that someday we would yeah. rather always be the uh, yeah uh, on the other side with the common man. Proponents of the people's rights. <laughs> so uh, maybe you know that was I think you know it was uh, largely a part of our thinking. Mm, but more than that we thought you know we should be a, there should be a neutral third party which on behalf of the people would exert pressure and ensure that it works with uh, accountability. Do you think you succeeded in doing that while TRS was in power? TRS but TRS was completely, you know, an undemocratic, its rule was undemocratic. They never wanted any third voice out. Yeah, yeah. When did you realize that? Yeah. When during their, their rule did you realize that? I think it uh, we took us two, three years okay. to understand that. Initially, we thought, you know, their understanding was insufficient. Initially, we thought they don't have sufficient information. And uh, eventually we understood that, you know, TRS uh, is trying to suppress all the uh, third forces deliberately. They are suppressing it deliberately so that they can have some kind of a monopolistic control over the political realm. That is it, you know. And having understood it, we realized that the political culture has to change completely. And this party never tolerates any opponents. And Did you have any problems? I mean, you're on your, your group. Yeah, we are not allowed to organize meetings. Um, there was continuous watch on us. Uh, cases are filed on us. More than anything else, you know, the way they, um, they kind of tabbed our phones. So it was uh, kind of you are under control. 1984 George Orwell's book came 
we were reminded of that and that big brother is watching so for the first time we realize that big brother is watching us 24 hours this happened right from the beginning or right no over a period of time first one two years it was okay they tolerated us but after that that day they decided i think the rupture started when we started questioning the power purchase agreement with chatisgarh we never realized that uh, they were getting some money in the deal. Oh, but you just questioned it. We questioned it. We said, you know, Telangana loses heavily. We shouldn't have an agreement like this. Mm. Mm. You know, it says, for example, that uh, whether you use or you don't use, you will you have to pay thousand crores to the other party. That is Chhattisgarh. Right. Obviously, the power lines between Telangana and Chhattisgarh were not laid down. When there is no power connection, how would you use it? Right. And knowing full well, why should you sign this? Mm. You are unnecessarily losing 1000 crores, which we can use for other purposes. Mm. So our understanding that was that, you know, that uh, due to some ignorance, they have signed this agreement. Mm. So we must ensure that this is rectified. It's much later we realized that uh, there were, you know, mm, more interests involved in it. Then similar questions we raised with regard to Kottagudam thermal power station that they were planning to erect and also the Badradri power plant that we were planning to start. So we, those uh, designs were faulty. They have chosen subcritical technology, which means, you know, that uh, pumps were of uh, the, the turbines were of a lower efficiency and uh, that would increase the pollution and increase the cost of production. So that uh, we what we challenged. The choice of technology is what we challenged. Similarly, we raised questions with regard to Malana Sagar. Why do you need such a huge reservoir? You can reduce its size, reduce you know the substantially the submergence and help the people who are losing their land. The government would not listen to us. I think you know after the first they have, uh, you know, exerted pressure on many organizations to leave JSC. That has happened. And subsequently, they started um, forcing us to vacate uh, assembly prim um, um, the <coughs> in the uh, quarters, MLA quarters we were having. Yeah, that was given to us. So, uh, so pressure was put on members and they had a lot of... Yeah, we had to vacate it. Then we started a new established office in a new premise. Mm. The person who helped us was targeted. Mm. Then, uh, you know, after that, uh, they started uh, uh, accusing us and also start targeted us, uh, uh, criticized us, all the ministers. Mm. So the idea was to isolate us. Right. Isolate us. Yeah, so obviously, you character assassinate and yeah. you. So people will be scared to meet you. So that's what uh, they were doing. But in spite of that, we continued our efforts. We have not kept quiet. It is interesting, sir. You said uh, when you first questioned regarding the Chhattisgarh project, you said we we assumed that maybe they are uh, they just don't know. But uh, that's an interesting thing to have a government and not know such basics. Ki <laughs> you still give them the benefit of doubt, yes. I guess. Ki let's maybe they are making a mistake. Yes. In spite of having such a huge uh, yeah. infrastructure of bureaucrats, bureaucrats and smart people and everything, maybe they are still making a mistake. Yes. So yes. let's just question. That's the understanding. Yeah. That's, That's the that. understanding. Similar issues we raised with regard to Kalisharam project. We said it's a huge mistake. Don't do it. Uh, we. Uh, at that time itself, we said it would be an engineering mistake to construct a project like this. Because, you know, you are trying to lift the flood. As it flows down, you would lift it and pump it up. Mm. What happens, you know, along with the in, uh, ongoing flood, you may have to lift the gates and uh, again leave it back. Mm. So it would be a huge wastage. So we said it's costly. It would be a waste of excess a, a people's money. Mm. You are wasting people's money. Don't do it. Mm. We were proposing the earlier side. Mm. And if more water is required, we must think of alternatives. And this Kaleshwaram is not the solution to fulfill the irrigation needs of Telangana. Mm. 
then uh, you know the conflict became even more intense. <laughs> so that is uh, how it unfolded. It was you know as if you know, the, there existed a regime which never tolerated a dissenting voice and that is why there was conflict between the, our, our people that is JAC and the government and the government. We wanted you know more accountable regime in place. So, that was the conflict between two of us. Having been a part of the movement uh, pretty strong just before TRS, BRS <coughs> came to power, you could have always opted, I mean if you wanted, you could have easily gotten a position of power. Because you were yes, part of it. That but was you, easy, you, you, it, easy was, it was nothing at that time for yes. because you, you were part of the movement and a strong, very, very strong part and therefore, in fact, it was your movement that was taken over and then you know, yeah, you know, obvious. But then you didn't do that. You didn't take that position. You yeah, stayed they out as a watchdog. They said contest and you can, uh, we will give you responsibilities after you become MP. But then we said no. We don't want to join the regime. We will remain outside and remain a kind of uh, represent the people's voice. So, so when, when we, so uh, if let us say all this corruption happened, okay, uh, by the power party that was in power. So, uh, what at what level do you think that was happening? Do you think it was right at the top or somewhere in between? What do you think? Much later, I think it was in 2017, just before the elections, we realized, you know, that uh, um, the regime is after money. You mean the, the family? Are, the the family is after money. They are accumulating wealth. And uh, then we started uh, after 2019, our, uh, you know, we were much more clear in our understanding about the nature of this regime. You can't be, there can't be a regime which is more exploitative than, than this. Okay, let's say we question them. And do you think there is some justification to why we were after money? Maybe the, if let's say their answer is I'm assuming that yeah, I'm in the political game. Therefore, I, I need to have the money to stay in power so I can keep the other bad parties out. Do you think that is just yeah, a answer? Yeah, that I can answer? understand. You know, every party makes a little money, saves a little money so that they remain in power. But this is the other way. The, you are running the government so that you can make money. <laughs> so your primary objective is to loot the common resources, yeah. make yourselves very rich. That is becomes the primary objective of the governance. Mm. Then obviously the society suffers the most. That's what has happened during the BRS. So is, do you think that's why they are out of power today? They, they are, are out, out of power, power because of that. When uh, the family at the helm of affairs indulges in corruption. Obviously, the local level leaders are encouraged. So, they are now sufficiently motivated to, uh, um, you know, to cheat people and make money at their own level. They do it and people at the higher up do not ask them. So, that is what has happened and uh, people are vexed with it. A farmer has told me, have you ever seen uh, Razakars, I said I was too, I was not even born before during that time. We have not seen, none of us have seen it. But now we know all these people behave in a much worse fashion than the Razakars of that time. So that was, you know, the common understanding among the people. It was an undemocratic regime, an exploitative regime. That is why people hated it. And more than anything else, it was not accessible to people. The dialogue between people and the government has completely broke down. It is always the via, via, <coughs> via others. It's you yes, cannot yes. access. You can't. You know the MLA says I am helpless. Uh, the chief minister, uh, I have to talk to the chief minister, and it is he who takes the decision. So the boss never takes the, um, for lifts the phone call. He never meets the MLA, and MLA cannot communicate the people's. Uh, 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 demands. So, the gap has uh, remained there. What do you think today, sir? The government that is in power today, what do you think about them? Now, uh, one good feature is that uh, they are available, they are accessible and they do not interfere in people's lives. You are allowed to express your views, you are allowed to organize your meeting. That interference is no longer there. So, people are happy, you know, we have a democratic atmosphere. That is what people desire and therefore they are happy. You give pensions or not, you know, you, you give us our freedom, 
then we will be very happy. This is what people are saying. It doesn't mean you that they don't want the other things. They also want pension. They also want the support from the financial support from the government. But in addition to that, they also want freedom. That is what they value so much. What has changed with you, sir? Today, do you think you could be a part of the government? If, no. if given a chance or if, I mean, would you want to? We campaign for its uh, victory and therefore uh, we have a, a say in the administration, a little say in the administration. But this time, are you, do you plan to just be a world like that? No, we, because you know, we supported it and the manifesto contained many of our suggestions and more or less we think along the same lines. So uh, then gen there is a general suggestion from the people, now you should not remain outside, you should be a part of this regime. So we don't want to, we want uh, uh, a, a, an opportunity to participate in the decision making process, whatever level it is possible, we would definitely accept it and we would contribute to the good governance.